Azima is the founder and director of Palestine Legal and cooperating counsel with the Center for Constitutional Rights, CCR. Prior to finding Palestine Legal in 2012, Dima worked with CCR as a cooperating attorney on the Mamilla Cemetery campaign, um, submitting a petition to the United Nations officials to stop the desecration to stop the desecration of an ancient Muslim cemetery in Jerusalem and advocating on behalf of Palestinian descendants um, of individuals interned, at, uh, interned in the cemetery. Dima has a JD from DePaul University College of Law and a master's degree in international and comparative legal studies from the University of London, SOAS, and a bachelor's degree in history and Near Eastern studies from the University of Michigan. Prior to studying law, Dima worked at Birzeit University, my alma mater, um, heading a research project on the role of informal justice mechanisms in the Palestinian legal system. Palestine Legal, the organization that she founded, works to bolster the Palestinian sol solidarity movement by challenging efforts to threaten, harass, and legally bully activists into silence and inaction. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Dima Khalidi to the podium. Um, it's really great to be here again. I had a chance to visit, was it a couple years ago, <laughs> a year and a half ago? And um, just echoing what Sandra said, um, you know, this, this kind of institution in the community is so important and critical. Um, and, you know, I didn't have it growing up in Chicago and, and other places and, and wish I did, really. Um, and I hope we can kind of export the model around the country because we need this kind of place to come together and to learn and to, to uh, you know, uh, bolster our community. Um, I think that's one of the things that's really missing for, for us here in the U.S. Um, and, and that our our cousins have done very well. Um, they have created many institutions that, that bring them together and, and increase their collective power. Um, so thank you all for, for building this, for to Basim and to, to all of the, the supporters of, of the center. Um, it's so critical. Um, and thank you, Rania and Dunya and everyone else who's been working so hard to put this together. I, you know, you see it on the back end. and. Really grateful for your for your work. Um, so I I what I want to do is talk a little bit about what I see um, from my vantage point uh, at Palestine Legal, uh, representing and advocating on behalf of people who are speaking out about Palestine. What are we seeing in terms of what the movement looks like right now, and what it's facing in terms of backlash? And then I want to talk just a, briefly about some of the things that we must and can do uh, to, to uh, continue raising our voices and to protect each other and ourselves uh, fr from the backlash. Um, and then, you know, I look forward to, to questions and, and conversation. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important to understand about this moment. I mean, we all feel this shift, we all feel a change, um, but, but it really, uh, we have to put it in the context of the last 15 years. Um, you know, the, the, the movement in the US has been uh, really building uh, from the grassroots. Um, and what we've seen, uh, we're now just starting to see the, the, the fruits of these efforts. Um, and what really characterizes the movement over the last 15 years or so and, and more is one, the, the youth-led nature of it. It's youth-powered in, in a lot of ways. Um, we have how many SJP, how many of you are college students? Not that many. <laughs> uh, how many are high school students? A few. <laughs> um, there are, I think, almost 200 Students for Justice in Palestine chapters or, or similar uh, Palestine solidarity uh, groups on campuses. Um, it's one of the biggest uh, student organizations in the country. And uh, you know, just this past year, they had their national conference 
at UCLA, and it was the biggest conference ever. Um, so, so what's happening on campuses has really uh, fueled a lot of, of the activism in, in this country over the last uh, decade and more. Um, and the other part of it, and this is kind of connected to the fact that, that this is a very youth-fueled youth movement, is the cross-movement work that's been happening. And it's been happening at a very grassroots level. It's been happening in a very uh, organic way um, where we see Palestinians and, and their allies here really connecting struggles. They see the connections with uh, a police brutality here in the US and, and the way that Israeli forces uh, routinely execute people, assassinate people. Um, they see the connections between the, the indigenous struggle here uh, for, for their rights and their land. Um, we're, and, and, it's, and it goes both ways. And the solidarity that we've seen is more than just uh, nominal. Um, it's not just saying, you know, I support. Um, it, we, we're, we're seeing people showing up for each other. Uh, there were Palestinians who went to Standing Rock and, and stayed there and, uh, you know, showed their support and uh, stood up next to uh, their indigenous um, brothers and sisters. Um, and, uh, you know, same, same with the Black Lives Matter movement and, and, uh, and other racial justice struggles and immigrant rights struggles. This is now a, a, a central part of the movement for Palestinian rights. It's really connecting these issues together, realizing that it's the same systems of oppression for all of us. Um, and in order for Palestinians to be free, we all have to, we all have to be free, and we all have, we have to work towards each other's collective liberation. Um, so I think this is really critical in this moment, and it's one of the reasons that we're seeing Palestine less siloed and, and more part of this broader conversation um, uh, 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 around progressive politics and, and social justice issues. Just some examples of the ways that we're seeing this kind of cross-movement work happening. Um, you know, again, connecting uh, the ways that uh, they're, the, they're the, um, the, the ways that responses to protests uh, are militarized. Um, uh, you know, comparing Standing Rock and Palestine. One, I think, example that I, I like to tell is, is that of students at Loyola University in Chicago, where I'm based. Um, uh, just the, the kind of uh, solidarity being more than just uh, nominal, right? We had students, uh, Students for Justice in Palestine chapter at Loyola. Um, one year, I think it, it was 2015, they, they did a protest, which was um, st uh, protesting a birthright Israel table. And they lined up, they just decided to do this the night before, they lined up with the signs of, of their, uh, their family's villages. Um, and they said, we want to sign up. This is our birthright. We come from here. Um, and, and we want a free trip. Um, and uh, immediately when they you know, confronted the people tabling, um, they, uh, the, the tablers, the, the birthright Israel tablers, ran off and complained to the administration, said they felt threatened. And it resulted in a, in a months long investigation and a kind of mini trial against the SJP students. We represented them. And, you know, ultimately they were found not responsible for everything except not registering their demonstration because there's some rule at the university. The next year, um, the, it was, you know, the, in the midst of the post-Ferguson um, uh, kind of uprising, the uh, students at Loyola organized a big demonstration um, in solidarity with the students at Missouri uh, University. And, uh, <clears throat> And there was a huge rally, and there were administrators, and everybody was very, you know, supportive. Um, and the students had a bunch of demands, and they went to the administration, and said, "Here are our demands: we want more teachers of color, we want this, that, and the other." And um, and then they said, "You know, our demonstration wasn't registered. 
um, you punished SJP last year, how come you're not punishing us? And the administration said, oh, well, in that case, we're, <laughs> we're gonna charge you. And we represented those students as well. And in the end, the university uh, changed its demonstration policy. Um, but what this illustrates to me is that, you know, one, the, the, the Black Lives Matter students who were organizing this demonstration were part of SJP. And vice versa, the Palestinian students were organizing uh, with, uh, with the black students on campus. And so uh, it wasn't even a question, right, um, that they would be standing up for each other and, uh, and kind of advocating for each other. That's the kind of um, solidarity that I think uh, it, it is really important and, and is starting to change things. Um, so uh, just, just one kind of example that sticks out to me. Of course, we have BDS, which has taken hold in the last, uh, again, 10, 15 years, in a way, uh, and, and it's kind of snowballed, where we are seeing now churches uh, divesting, and uh, obviously student governments divesting, or calling for divestment. Um, you know, soccer teams and football players and, and uh, superstar singers uh, refusing to play in Israel. Um, and uh, this, of course, has, uh, has galvanized a lot of people. It's, it's a way for people to organ organize around this issue in the US. And I think it's really important also to recognize how much the voices of black activists and intellectuals um, uh, uh, you know, speaking out on this issue has, uh, has influenced the debate here uh, around Palestine. Um, <clears throat> and also the absurdity of the backlash against them has really uh, shown um, how, uh, how desperate um, uh, Israel and its supporters are here to silence the conversation. When you have uh, um, you know, civil rights icons like Angela Davis uh, you know, being refused uh, a, an award, a civil rights award in her hometown uh, of Birmingham. Um, and when you have people like Mark Lamont Hill, who, you know, is a, uh, who we'll see tonight, um, y you know, getting the kind of backlash he got for, uh, you know, placing Palestine within his uh, conception of uh, racial justice and, and uh, collective liberation. And I think we're, right now we're in this place where we're seeing, um, you know, polls showing this shift happening. Um, it's showing that that uh, people are more receptive to the concept of sanctions against Israel. Um, it, they're more receptive to a one-state possibility. Um, they're more, generally more supportive of Palestinians than they have been perhaps ever. Um, and even more so when you're talking about younger, more liberal, uh, progressive Democrats, right? Um, so, so that's what we're starting to, to see take effect with our uh, fantastic uh, freshman class of women of color standing up, talking about this, opening the doors, and uh, also obviously being attacked ferociously. And it's not just Rashida and Hilhan, of course. We're talking about, um, you know, the, this situation where, uh, again, we, I know this, this was a, one of the kind of topics uh, from the last session, but we're, we're seeing uh, people taking a stand and, uh, you know, it, it's filtering up, right? Uh, the top democratic contenders are realizing that they can't just be blindly pro-Israel and get elected. This is, I think, uh, really a, a, an immense change. Um, and it's never been the case where you don't go to APAC and it's okay, right? Um, now, of course, <laughs> um, this slide looks very strange. I don't know why, sorry. That's Sheldon Adelson right here, if you couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> Saban is not on here, but we have many boogeymen that we could, we could include. Um, so I, certainly I think the Netanyahu-Trump alliance has clarified for a lot of people where they should stand on this issue. 
um, one of the most extreme, the most extreme right-wing government in Israeli history, um, and in, in probably US history, um, and the alliances are very obvious, um, and their shared values are very obvious. Um, now, this means, of course, that what we're facing in terms of uh, the backlash is quite immense. Um, it means that we have people in positions of power who are making these decisions, right? So I have over here on the, the right, Kenneth Marcus, who was appointed by Trump to head civil rights at the Department of Education. Why is that important? Because this same guy has been uh, filing complaints and lawsuits against universities for allegedly tolerating a, a, an anti-Semitic environment because all of these students are organizing on campus and they claim that this creates an anti-Semitic environment for Jewish students who support Israel. So this same guy now is in charge of deciding these complaints that his uh, Zionist organization uh, counterparts are submitting to him. He will be responsible for deciding whether uh, these uh, complaints make a claim of, of discrimination against Jewish students. And it's clear what his agenda is, and he's already working uh, to implement that. So, uh, you know, the, the, the threats are real, and what we're seeing in terms of the backlash are increasingly desperate measures, um, because Israel and its supporters understand that they're losing the hearts and minds. They understand that campuses are, uh, y you know, that students are, uh, are hearing a different message and, and understanding this issue very differently. Um, and, e and they're starting to see that in Congress, Congress, which is their turf, you know. Um, so I want to just explain a little bit about what that looks like for us. Um, you know, our work is focused on responding to all kinds of attacks on, uh, on people who speak out. And we see that with the attacks on Mark Lamont Hill, you know, uh, um, but what, what, the way we've coined it is that there's really a Palestine exception when it comes to free speech in this country. We have a very strong First Amendment, you know, we're well known around the world for, uh, you know, having the strongest kind of free speech protections. We are allowed to say anything we want. The KKK can march in Skokie, Illinois, and they're protected, right? But when it comes to Palestine, all of a sudden, that uh, those rights somehow uh, diminish. Oh boy, okay, thanks. Um, so, what does it look like? We have 27 states now that have laws, have enacted laws punishing boycotts for Palestinian rights. Um, and again, this is the turf of Israel lobby groups. Um, they said very clearly, you know, we're moving from the campuses where you're engaged in your youthful antics and we're taking this to the big house where you know, we have the, the power and we're gonna make your cause improbable. This is a quote from uh, an Israel lobbyist, right? So this is w where they know they have influence and they've managed to pass this, these laws in 27 states, um, uh, as well as in the federal government. We're seeing law after law being introduced and they're not, they haven't been uh, successful yet, but they keep trying. False accusations of anti-Semitism, they underlie most of the incidents that we see. Um, as we know, this is a primary tactic to shut down the conversation. As soon as you're accused of being anti-Semitic because of your support for Palestinian rights, uh, there's an autom automatic suspicion. Um, there's an investigation. There are, uh, you know, uh, your suspect and, um, and, and your discourse is always questioned. And I, I don't know how much Mark will talk about his experience, but of course, you know, he was fired from CNN for what he said at the UN, uh, from the river to the, to the sea, Palestine will be free, in the context of this larger speech. But the, the automatic accusation was that he was calling for uh, violence against Jewish people, that he was anti-Semitic. Um, and uh, you know, this has become weaponized 
to the point where CNN fired him automatically, to the point where you know, the, the temple, where, temple University where he worked uh, w called for an investigation. Parallel to the false accusations of anti-Semitism, of course, are accusations of support for terrorism. And these are even more uh, um, uh, kind of, they're, they're really more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, they have more consequences, especially now with the Trump administration that has the power to initiate criminal investigations and things like that. And we're seeing this, this tactic used more and more. So, so it's something that we're looking into. It looks like posters being plastered around campuses with students' names, calling them terrorist supporters just for being part of a SJP or calling for BDS. It looks like Canary Mission. How many of you are on it here? <laughs> Yay, uh, only two, that's fantastic. Um, uh, it looks like more and more covert tactics. We're seeing Israel uh, specifically um, you know, allocating money to these kinds of uh, um, shady websites and things like Canary Mission, anonymous efforts to uh, undermine, to smear, uh, to defame uh, activists. Um, and we saw a lot of that in, this, the, in the censored Al Jazeera documentary that was leaked. Um, you know, they're, they're using uh, social media and, uh, and uh, different tactics to try to, to, to intimidate people to the point where it's too costly for us to be talking about this issue. Lawsuits and legal threats, we're seeing more and more of these. Um, you know, lawsuits against professors like Rabab Abdel Hadi at San Francisco State University, against the American Studies Association for endorsing an academic boycott, et cetera, et cetera. And the kind of community censorship we see. Sandra knows well about the, the um, History Museum in Missouri uh, canceling uh, a joint event uh, talking about Ferguson and Palestine and, and Mexico. Uh, as soon as they learned it was it, it involved Palestine, they canceled it. Um, you know, so these kinds of things are happening regularly. So, what can we do? Um, I I think this is where the conversation should really focus. Um, of course, you know, as a lawyer. I, uh, one of the things that we try to do at Palestine Legal is to arm people uh, with knowledge of their rights. So know your rights. That's primary, I think, uh, a fundamental thing that we can all do. Uh, we have the First Amendment, um, and it's a really important tool to protect us from the kind of government interference in our speech. So you know, the, the anti-boycott laws are being challenged in court. A couple of courts have said, this, this is First Amendment protected activity already. Um, so we have to know and understand what our First Amendment rights are. Even if somebody calls our, our advocacy for Palestine controversial or uh, offensive, um, we have the right to talk about this and, and we have to continue to do that. Um, also knowing our rights when it comes to encounters with law enforcement. Um, how many of you know what to do if the FBI shows up at your door? This is something our community has faced for, for many years, of course. And, uh, and still, we see people who do not know what to do if, if you encounter law enforcement. And this is critical. You know, Nobody ever has to talk to any kind of law enforcement, ever. Um, all you have to say is, give me your card and my attorney will call you. Find an attorney. Call us. What you know? Call Abed. Call uh, any number of the attorneys in, in this room. You have to uh, assert your rights in order to have them. Um, so this kind of, of knowledge uh, is really critical for us to have um, before we engage or as we engage on this issue, um, because there are real threats and and we have to be prepared to deal with them. Speaking out, um, you know, this is what we're here to protect. We're here to protect the space, to make sure people aren't intimidated to the point where they don't want to talk about this, they don't want to engage on campus, they don't want to uh, be part of an SJP or, uh, uh, you know, engage with their professional associations or what have you. 
Um, I, you know, just a few things that I think are important. Um, we're talking about, and, and this came up again at, in the conversation with Sandra, um, we're talking about a situation of oppression. Um, we're talking about uh, a, a situation of inequality. Um, and we have to be really uh, well versed in, in this language. Um, we have to put out our values. What are we for? Um, and, and I think uh, there, there's a lot of work being done around this. You know, uh, organizations like the Institute for Middle East Understanding are a great resource um, for, for all of us when we're speaking out on this issue. They have a messaging document that is really important to, to use because we, we have to be smart in the way that we're talking about this. We have to put on our sleeves what we're fighting for um, uh, because otherwise it will, be, it will be defined for us. Um, otherwise, we will always be responding to uh, the way that uh, Israel advocacy groups are defining us. Um, so we're for freedom and equality and justice um, and, and human rights. We have to be talking about occupation and apartheid in a way that people understand it here. Um, you know, connecting the issues, uh, connecting it to the civil rights struggle, et cetera. Um, we have to explain what boycotts are and why. Why are we engaging in boycotts for Palestinian rights? Um, it, BDS is, has become the boogeyman, right? Um, people don't understand what BDS is, but what are boycotts? What was the, uh, you know, the, the boycott uh, in Mississippi, the bus boycott? Uh, what was the, the boycott against apartheid South, South Africa or the farm worker boycott? Um, th these are the terms that we have to use for everyday people to understand what we're saying. Um, international law, you know, these are, th these are things that everyday people don't get. You know, what is an occupation? Uh, well, I'm a lawyer. Um, you know, we have to explain this is a military occupation. This is something that affects people in their everyday lives. Let's tell our stories, um, you know, of, of, of the checkpoints around our villages. Um, this is the kind of language we have to use. Um, I, I want to make a plug, too, for just the media work. How many of you write op-eds? How many of you uh, write letters to the editor, to your uh, newspaper, every time you see a, a, an awful article by, by the opposition? We have to make our voices heard in every forum. Um, because the reality is that, the, the, you know, if they don't hear from us, they don't know that there's another side, right? They don't know that there's another viewpoint. And the more that we submit these things, the more that they hear, um, they, they'll, they're gonna be forced to recognize that and to, to print it. Um, the other, I think, this is a, a messaging guidebook that I, I encourage folks to have, just you know, simplifying our language. I, I already know. The other th and last point I, I'll make is, um, is the um, advocacy, the legislative advocacy. Um, I've talked to a lot of legislators, state legislators, um, as well as Congress people, and automatically what I hear is, well, we never hear from you. We never hear from you. So let them hear from us, and they're beginning to hear from us, and that's what's making this shift at the top, right? Um, they're beginning to hear from us, and we have to keep that pressure up. That's the only way they're going to respond. They have to respond when we call and when we email and when we show up at their offices. They have to respond, and uh, and I think we're all starting to see that, and and we're starting to to make those moves. So I encourage you all to do that. It is possible to defeat these things. Thank you. Um, yeah, just even even though we have 27 laws, anti boycott laws on the books. Dozens of others have been defeated. And I encourage Sandra to tell you the story of the Missouri law that was defeated. Um, you know, there, there's organizing that's necessary and, and we have to step up and, and do that work. Mm -hmm.